After touring the five regions of the Gambia, the African Union torch has now found a new home. The torch, described as a torch of hope, was lit on the 23rd of May to mark the 50 year anniversary of the formation of the OAUAU. And as we hear in this report by Ababukar Senghor, the symbolic object will now be kept at the home of Gambian Artifact, the National Museum. The torch was ignited on May 23rd, 2013, at the July 22nd square, just as it was lit in all other cities of AU member countries in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the OAU-AU. OAU-AU touch is a symbol of commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the, from the formation of the Organization of African Unity, which was lighted on the 23rd of May at the Makati Square here, because all member countries within the AU, A, OAU, AU member countries, they are all asked to do a commemoration of that nature. And uh, in the Gambia here, this is the touch, which says the 58th anniversary, and then it was lighted at the uh, July 22nd square on the, 22nd, on the 23rd of May uh, 2013. The touch, described as the touch of hope, symbolizes the rebirth of Pan-Africanism and African unity was displayed in all the five regions of the Gambia as it is now installed at the National Museum. Director Jalo further stated that it will be available for public viewing in a week's time. This is um, uh, available for public viewing um, in the next uh, one week. It should be in because at the moment we have already um, prepared the space for it, the abbot where it would be placed in here, you know, side to side with the Gambia's national anthem and uh, the Gambia's flag. And uh, that also commemorates the, uh, the, 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 the importance of African unity and uh, the, the, the contribution that the Gambia is doing into it. So it would be, the, uh, the museum is open and people are, um, are invited to come and have a look of this touch and uh, maybe even feel it. Recalling one of the landmark speeches during events marking the 50th anniversary of the OAUAU in Ethiopia, in which President Jame emphasized the need to cast aside the differences that militate against African unity while urging Africans to rally around the African Union in order to bring meaningful cooperation and development to the continent. The Creative and Performing Arts Director also urged Gambians to find time to view the object at its new home at the National Museum. It's very important for people to come and have a look at it. So we are urging all Gambians or, and visitors who have the chance to come down around Banjul to come and take a look, to come and look at this brilliant, magnificent um, uh, icon of, of history which is being deposited in the National Museum in here. With the African Union celebrating its 50-year anniversary, celebrants are of the belief the message that symbolizes the torch can serve to spur Africans to dedicate themselves to African solidarity and development as the continental body enters another landmark period in its development. For JRS News, this is Babukar Senghor. Not many people know who he was. However, Kukoi Sambasanyang had been in the country's political scene since the late 1970s. After making unsuccessful attempts to represent his constituency in parliament, Kukoi Sambasanyang rallied behind a Rakta group in an attempt to overthrow the Jawara administration in 1981. As we hear in this report by Ibrahim Balde, the country's prime fugitive, who had been on the run for several decades, reportedly died in Mali resonated throughout the length and breadth of the country. Kukwe Sambasanyang, as he was widely known in the country, was the notorious rebel leader behind the 1981 abortive coup in the Gambia, during which hundreds of people died. In his memoir entitled Karaba, Sadada Karaba Jaura attempted to recount the horrendous experience he underwent whilst on holiday in England upon hearing the news that Kukwe has staged a coup against his government. In his book, he managed to publish the only known photo of the so-called 12-member National Revolutionary Council headed by Kukoi Sambasanyang. The leftist NRC accused Jawara's government of being, quote, corrupt, tribalistic, and despotic, end of quote. They announced the suspension of the country's constitution to establish a dictatorship of the proletariat. The coup attempt ended on the 5th of August. When Senegalese troops defeated the rebel forces, Sanyan took refuge in Libya, which had given him backing for the coup attempt. In 1995, the Farafenya army 
camp was attacked by half a dozen men who killed some Gambians and held the camp for several hours. Born in Wasadu in the West Coast region in the early 1950s, Kuko received his education in the Gambia before joining the seminary in Zigansor in Kasamas to be a priest. Kuko abandoned the idea altogether and decided to switch to party politics and ran twice as a candidate for the opposition NCP in the 1970s and was unsuccessful in his bid. Throughout his life, Kuko Samba Sanyang had remained elusive, sorting around the greater Senegambia sub-region surreptitiously. In April this year, Senegal declared him persona non grata. After appeal from humanitarian organizations to deport him to the Gambia, he was flown to Mali, where he was granted asylum. It was reported that Kuko Samba Sanyang was recently taken ill. And on Wednesday this week, it was reported that Kuko Samba Sanyang had died and had been buried in Bamako. Ibrahim Abalde, GRTS. As today, Thursday, 28 June 2013, falls on the 11th day of Shahaban, the 8th month of the Muslim calendar 1434H, the Gambia Supreme Islamic Council, in collaboration with the Imam Ratib of Banjul, reminds the general public that the holy month of Ramadan is the 9th month of the Islamic calendar. As such, a media release from the Gambia Supreme Islamic Council urges all imams, religious leaders, scholars, and the general public to give attention to the date of Sahaban and the beginning of Ramadan in order to unify the voice of Muslims in the country. Time now to take our first break. We'll be back. Under pressure from massive street demonstrators, Brazil's two biggest cities are throwing out the transit fare hikes that initially sparked the unrest. It is not clear if that will be enough to appease the demonstrators who took to the streets in some cities again on Wednesday. About 10,000 demonstrators clashed with riot police in Fortaleza a Brazil, as Brazil was playing Mexico in the Confederations Cup. The fare hikes are just seen as a catalyst of protests on much bigger issues. CNN Shasta Dalintin reports. For nearly two weeks, tens of thousands of Brazilians marching through the streets night after night. A movement that started as a protest against the nine cent hike in bus fares scores a major victory. Both Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro agreed to roll back the prices on both bus and metro tickets. But is it too little too late? We are fighting against corruption. We are fighting against um, the political system that is now. Flavio Sampaio says he joined the marches after he saw police firing tear gas and rubber bullets at peaceful protesters. Now he's marching for a better country for his kids. Recent demonstrations were marked by violence on both sides. Tuesday night, a group of protesters tried to storm the office of Sao Paulo's mayor, kicking through the glass doors. Wednesday, the city cleaned away signs of looting and vandalism. It's this kind of destruction that could really alienate people. Protesters broke in the windows last night. They burnt this guard station down. You can see not much left but charcoal and broken glass. Some residents were angered, but this shopkeeper said he didn't believe it was the protesters who broke into his jewelry store. It was a gang, he says, that took advantage of the movement to steal and damage things. The movement has galvanized people across the country who say they're fed up with high taxes and a lack of services like health and education, while the government spends billions on the World Cup. The majority of marchers are young and well-educated. Mateus Pires is a university student and one of the organizers. He says public transportation should be free, especially in expensive, sprawling cities like Sao Paulo. You can't go to a hospital, you can't see your friends, you can't go to school, you can't get to work. He said lowering fares would prove the government was listening. But it's too soon to know if it will bring an end to protests or fuel further and more far-reaching demands. 
China Space Program has accomplished.